Rubble covered the ground across the field that was once a proud city of Manhattan. It had been six months since the attack reached its end. But pockets of flame still rose to serve as a reminder of just what had happened. No one was allowed in except for military officials. Even they had to wear anti-radiation suits to protect themselves from the outer environment. What made everything worse, however, were the excavations of dead from either the surface world or the subway systems below. Thousands upon thousands of bodies that had been placed in mass graves and either burned or buried by bulldozers. The army dash what was left of the US National Guard corned off the city like the Russians did to Chernobyl. They even gave the stench of land a new name. Ground G. What made it worse for those guarding the hollowed ground was this fact that many had once lived there. They would look on at the rubble and imagine the metropolis that was no more. Those with the unfortunate task of burying the dead could only be in the area for exactly 15 minutes. After that, they ran the risk of falling ill from radiation sickness. That would then result in vomiting, major stomach pains, and eventually death. A slow and painful death was that in which soldiers feared the most. To make it worse, the search for the survivors in the cities had reached its end three days ago. If anyone was alive in Manhattan, they would have to find their own way out, or they would die. The smell of rotting flesh, scorched skin, and dried blood only added to the paranoia and anxiety of those stationed at Ground G. Yet despite this, many people still found their way into the destroyed city. The vast majority were scientists and radiation experts sent by the U.S. federal government. Their main priority was the expedition and salvation of G-cells. Despite the horrors the attack had proven to be, his cells opened a door in many possibilities. It was this moment that the U.S. government stepped in and wanted as many salvageable cells as possible. Experiments then could be conducted on the cells, and new breakthroughs could be discovered. The most promising of these ideas was the creation of a reverse radiation formula, which if done successfully could result in ending all fears of the dreaded fallout. G-cells became a huge frenzy in the world economy almost immediately. Russia especially took interest in them. But Ground G was corned off to the outside world. Night had fallen like it always did every damn day in this country. But now, it was their time to shine. Like they had been paid to do, the captain and his team suited up and began to head out into the rubble. Almost instantly, this caused the captain to sweat profusely. His radiation suit felt slightly too tight around his groin area, which annoyed him. But in far more things he needed to worry about then a little chafing. You ready, Ursus? Asked a member of his team. Captain Ursus was caused... Captain Ursus was caught off guard by the voice coming through his mask. He felt a slight anger boil inside. How many times have I got to tell you? He said, voice stern. Speak English and only English. Sorry, sir. Ursus took several steps forward and rest on the ground. His M4A1 rifle bobbed up and down with the strap around his shoulder. To make it worse for him, the heavy backpack full of forged equipment added well over 80 pounds to his whole body. This was going to be a challenge in more than one way, he thought as he pushed several fallen bricks out of his way. Ursus! shouted a member of the crew. We've got some cells over here. Ursus pointed to the others to go over to that location. They complied without hesitation. The captain always wondered why everyone called him Ursus. Sure, he was slightly larger than most, but they were plenty bigger. It stuck, however. And though his real names were strapped to his dog tags around his neck, everyone called him Ursus. Ursus. Bear. He loved that title. A member of the crew kneeled down and unveiled the jars full of alcoholic substances to preserve the scratched off charcoal gray scales. With tongs, the soldiers began to pick it up and place it inside. Others began to search the perimeter for more G cells. All right, said a man. This went quicker than I thought. Ursus paid no attention and continued to walk back and forth, hand on his gun strap, 
at all times. So far there had been no patrols searching the area for smugglers, but he knew that this would soon change. 24 hours a day, some sort of party came through the city in a total of 15 minutes. That caused Ursus to remember that the clock was ticking. He stared down at his wrists and saw the timer clicking one second at a time. Ten minutes until the radiation levels within their suits reached critical levels. Even now, the captain had no clue as to how much radiation was seeping through the suit every second. He thought of Chernobyl back in his homeland. Though the destruction was nothing compared to this, the levels of radiations were all too similar in his eyes. They knew the disaster here was far worse than anything that happened in the 1980s, but it still struck a strange core with him. Captain! shouted a voice. This snapped Ursus out of his trance and back into reality. One of his men came scrambling over to them, rifles swinging back and forth. The captain placed one hand on his gun swing and prepared for anything. Panting, the man said, We got a car coming. It's not a patrol, but it's a scientist group. They'll want to know what we're doing here. Out here. Tell them we're doing the same thing as they are, gathering cells. Will we get away with this? Asked another member of the team. Ursus turned around and saw a man had stopped putting cells inside the vials. Get back to work and I'll handle this. Ursus reassured as he walked forward. Through his suit he could start hearing the sound of a motor vehicle moving forward. A feeling of nervousness began to fill his body. But he had to remain cool, he thought. Just keep calm and this will all be over soon. An armored car pulled up beside the smoking pile of rubble. It turned off as three scientists made their way over to Ursus. He watched as they approached, hands still on their sling of the guns. But then he noticed that these people had no guns at all, but large radios strapped to their backs. Still, that was not going to let them take his guard down. Good evening, the captain said as he took one of the scientists' hands. He could see blue eyes through the mask of its suit. The man was also much taller than Ursus and a lot rounder. Yeah stated the stout man. It's nice to see someone other than G.I.'s out here. What outfit you boys with? Nurse's motion backed to the people gathering cells. We were with the 92nd, he began. We just got sent out here this morning. You? Oh, gosh. We've been out here for three months collecting those damn things. In and out, in and out, same old, same old, you know. I hear ya, Nurse stated. Feel free to look around as well. We found a cluster of cells here. Much obliged. The salt man then motioned for the other two of his crew in yellow radiation suits to move forward in another direction. The captain watched him intensely as they moved towards several of his men. He slowly loosened his grip on the sling. It was then that the stout man stopped and watched a man placing cells inside a vial. What are you doing, son? He asked as he leaned forward. I found these here, so I'm collecting, the other man stated. Well played, thought Ursus. And one of those things, the stout man began to laugh. Not like that. The radiation would leak all out all over the place. Here, let me take a look at that. Ursus felt his heart leap out of his chest at that moment and immediately reached for his gun sling again. This was going to get rough. Wait, what the hell? The stout man asked. These aren't standard issue vials at all. These aren't even American. He paused as Ursus' men stood up and backed away. Smugglers, radio this in. Instantly, Ursus threw his gun to his shoulder and let out a burst of fire. The stout man fell to the ground with a thud, three gaping holes now in his body, and blood seeping to the ground. The other two guys began to scramble for their radios when they too were hit with a barrage of fire. One man was hit directly in the head, causing the mask to shatter and blood to drain out. Ursus ran forward as the firing stopped. Come on, he barked. Grab what's left and let's get the hell out of here before backup arrives. Ursus and three others stepped forward, guns drawn as they heard other vehicles approaching. Then footsteps followed, and the captain could tell that they were large numbers. They soon came in sight of dozen American soldiers popped up from behind rubble. Smugglers! One ordered. Drop your guns and put your hands up! Flashlights shined down on all of them as Ursus pinned his gun to full automatic. He could hear the others do the same. Just then, the captain pulled the trigger and bullets smacked down in front of the Americans. Smoke flew into the air as one of his men tossed a grenade in the soldier's direction. The rest of the captain's crew gathered their equipment as hastily as they could and made a mad dash 
for cover as Ursus emptied his clip into the stomach of the chest of an American. Another smoke bomb was thrown and white plume blocked everyone's sight. This gave the party a chance to run for the subway system below the Earth's surface. Ursus led the way one step at a time as the ground trembled beneath his feet. Sweat began to pour profusely out of his pores while doing so as the sound of American troops drew closer and closer from behind. One of his men turned and fired several rounds from behind. This caused the Americans to split and shoot from behind cover blindly. Come on, Ursus shout, into the subways. He led them down the rubber-filled stairs and into the first station. Several decomposed bodies lay on the ground around them, not being touched since the attack had ended. Ursus almost stepped on one in a highly decorated uniform with a colonel insignia on its shoulder. A piece of metal was protruding from the man's right shoulder, and dry blood was all over the ground. Ursus tried to pay no, no attention thought of the hell below here as the war raged above. The sound of gunfire made him stop and look back as man piled past. Ursus took aim and fired several rounds of the Americans' direction as they made their way down the same stairs that they had planned on making. Ursus planned on making their lives hell, trying to catch up with them before anything else could happen. Just then, he made a mash dash for the rest of his crew, suit rubbing up and down on the skin, creating painful sores around his arms and groin area. But the adrenaline flowing through his body forced him to pay little attention to this. Captain! shouted one of Ursus's men. Get down! Ursus complied as Tracer shot overhead. Several American troops fell to the ground and others took cover behind a concrete stairway. The dust knocked to the ground and mists upon dead bodies below. In the process, several soldiers took cover and shot blindly in a downward direction. This created a lot of chaos for Ursus's men, who continued to run into the clearing. With no gun, Ursus made his way down into the next level of the subway. Something caught his leg, jolting him to stop. He looked at what was saw another dead man. Decomposed body splayed out underneath a bit of rubble. Others were close by, most having civilian clothing. Ursus looked on in horror as he saw a woman holding a baby right beside another stairway. This is ugly. He thought his footsteps approached it from above. He turned to see more dead bodies covering the ground in litters. Captain, shouted one of his men. Come on, come on, over here. Ursus moved forward and met up with the rest of his group. He checked them out and saw that they were all here, and cases full of G-cells intact. This created a sense of release for Ursus. And he patted a man on the shoulder and began to speak. The fight almost over. Let's go, he said with a tiny laugh. We've got five minutes to get to the boat, and I don't want to be late. As he finished, they all ran down the subway tunnel to their destination, Ursus feeling that they had just achieved a victory as they went deeper and deeper in the tunnels that water dripped from the ceiling.